Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Winecast. A very special Winecast, in fact, because this is the 100th cast that I've done, and in honor of that occasion, I wanted to cast on a region that I don't think gets nearly enough attention and play, but means a lot to me, Washington State. As many of you know from some of my previous casts, California is where I grew up, but Washington is my adopted home and my adopted wine industry, and both Washington and its industry have been good to me, so I thought I'd return the favor and put it down for the Evergreen State and for its remarkable wines on my 100th cast. As far as anyone knows, Vitis vinifera plantings first came to Washington State in 1825 when cuttings were planted in Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River in what would later become the western part of the state. But clear evidence of winemaking doesn't turn up for another quarter century or so until German and Italian immigrants began vinifying juice from vines they planted on arrival to what was then called the Washington Territory. Though you'd never guess it today, Washingtonians in the late 19th and early 20th centuries positively loved to prohibit things, with Seattle passing local bans on smoking, gambling, and alcohol, and with the whole state going dry in 1916, a few years before the U.S. adopted national prohibition. Prohibition had a devastating impact on Washington wine producers with virtually no wineries surviving that 13-year nightmare. And when production became legal again, as with many parts of the United States, the taste in Washington was for sweet, fortified wines that soon dominated the local industry and that in Washington state tended to be made from the native North American variety, Concord. The post-prohibition sweet tooth was bad enough, but what really hindered the Washington industry's development during most of the 20th century were aggressive protectionist trade policies enacted by the state legislature that subjected out-of-state wines to a markup of as high as 77% and that gave local producers little incentive to improve their product to compete with out-of-state and foreign wines, and made it expensive for wine collectors to build their cellars unless they were willing to face the possibility of legal jeopardy. How real a possibility was this? Well, take the case of the late Belding H. Scribner, a professor of medicine at the University of Washington who, in addition to being a pioneer in nephrology and kidney dialysis research, was an avid collector of fine wines, particularly Bordeaux's. To avoid both the tariffs and the hassle of having to purchase his wines through the State Liquor Control Board as required by law, Dr. Scribner ordered his bottles from an importer in San Francisco and, in his own words, would load a few cases in the back of my station wagon and haul them back up the coast. Things got ugly, though, when the wife of a colleague who had a falling out with Scribner turned him into the State Liquor Control Board in 1968 in an act of revenge. The board then sent agents to Belding Scribner's house while he was away at a conference in New Jersey, who entered through an unlocked door, confiscated his collection, and left him a note to that effect, along with a request that he surrender himself to authorities when he returned. After he turned himself in, he was charged with a crime, tried and given a six-month suspended sentence, fined, and then allowed to buy back his wines by paying what would have been the 77% markup that the wines would have received had they been brought into the state by legal means. Needless to say, Dr. Scribner wasn't happy about any of this and wrote an angry article to that effect in Seattle Magazine a few months after the raid, arguing that his only crime was breaking a law designed to protect wines that because of their lack of quality didn't deserve much in the way of protection. The article caused quite a stir, and while it shouldn't be overcredited for what came next, it was a voice in the rising tide of criticism that the state legislature was receiving, and that led to a debate the following year resulting in the passage of House Bill 100 that repealed most of the protective tariffs on out-of-state wine and opened the local industry up to competition. Luckily, two wineries in Washington, American Wine Company that would later become Chateau St. Michel, and even later St. Michel Wine Estates, and Associated Vintners that was founded by a group of University of Washington professors who were amateur winemakers and that would eventually become Columbia Winery, were making clear moves in the direction of quality dry wine production, and along with other producers incentivized by the newly competitive environment, began growing Washington's reputation for quality production. And where's Washington now? Currently, it's the second largest producer of vinifera wine in the United States, responsible for about 5% of all U.S. production. There are about 55,000 acres under vine in Washington, with two-thirds of those acres planted to red varieties and one-third planted to white. Every year, Washington produces about 17.5 million cases of wine, 2 million of which, fun fact, is accounted for by just the Riesling produced by Chateau St. Michel, the largest single producer of Riesling in the world. 
In addition to the Chateau, as the locals call it, there are over 900 other bonded wineries operating in the state of Washington, and these wineries source grapes from a total of 14 American viticultural areas, all but one of which located in the eastern half of the state and all but two of these AVAs, the Columbia Gorge AVA and the new Lewis Clark Valley AVA, are located within the very large Columbia Valley AVA, with the two AVAs I just mentioned abutting it but not overlapping it. 99%, and that's not an exaggeration, of Washington's grapes are grown in the eastern part of the state that, despite Seattle and western Washington's fame as rainy and green, is a semi-arid steppe with desert-like weather conditions and a continental climate, thanks to the rain shadow created by the Cascade Mountains that protects it from the maritime climate of western Washington that's home to the geographically extensive but sparsely planted Puget Sound AVA. In a curious irony, though only about 92 acres of Puget Sound are under vine, a big chunk of Washington's wine is made in or around this AVA, with over 300 wineries located within or not far from it, with the biggest concentration of them, a little over 100, congregating in and around the town of Woodenville, just northeast of Seattle. These are largely boutique wineries with annual production runs, usually under 5,000 cases, that don't own their own vineyard land and buy their grapes from growers in eastern Washington and have the grapes trucked in for vinification at their facilities in western Washington. The reasons why things shook out this way are too complicated to cover in this cast, but the end result is that despite some big players like St. Michelle Wine Estates in Columbia, the Washington industry is filled with small, quality-minded producers and is oriented toward boutique wine production rather than high-volume, large-format production. Speaking of AVAs, Washington's oldest is the Yakima Valley, awarded in 1983, and one of only three AVAs in Washington where more white grapes than red grapes are planted. 1984 saw the establishment of both the Columbia Valley AVA and the Walla Walla Valley AVA, that both, incidentally, like one other American viticultural area, dipped down into Oregon State. There were no further AVAs awarded until 1995 with the creation of Puget Sound. It was the new millennium, though, that saw the biggest boom in American viticultural area growth, with Red Mountain, Columbia Gorge, another majority white growing area as well as a straddler of the Oregon-Washington border, Horseheaven Hills, Rattlesnake Hills, the Waluke Slope, Snipes Mountain, and Lake Chelan added during the 2000s, and Natchez Heights, the third major white dominant area, Ancient Lakes, and the Lewis Clark Valley, shared with Idaho, added during the 2010s. What grows in all of these AVAs? Well, the state's top seven whites as of 2015 were Chardonnay, Riesling, Pinot Gris, Sauvignon Blanc, Gewurztraminer, Viognier, and Semillon, while the top reds are Cab Sauve, Merlot, Syrah, Cab Franc, Malbec, Pinot Noir, and Sangiovese. But there are almost 70 varieties currently grown in the state, with new ones turning up regularly as growers explore how Washington's terroirs suit different grapes. Despite all of this success with different grapes, or maybe because of it, no one grape has risen above the rest to become a signature grape for the state the way that, say, Cab Sauve and Chardonnay did for California and Pinot Noir for Oregon. While this lack of attachment to a particular variety might be great from a perspective that focuses on choice, options, and diversity, it's hell on marketing and it's no secret that the Evergreen State struggles with an image problem when it comes to giving consumers something that comes readily to mind when they hear about wine from Washington. All of this variety and quality in Washington actually made it pretty hard to come up with a reasonably sized list of suggestions of things to look for if you want to try more Washington wines. But here are some thoughts on some things that I think Washington does particularly well. First, be on the lookout for wines made in the style of the Southern Rhone, or for varietal wines made from Rhone or Spanish heritage grapes like Grenache, Mourved, Cunoise, and Sanso. Eastern Washington has a climate similar to several of the climates in southern France and various parts of Spain, so it's no surprise that grapes that shine there shine here too. And speaking of Rhone grapes, don't forget the big daddy of them all and what many critics think should be Washington's signature grape, Syrah. Depending on where it's grown and how it's managed, Syrah expresses in a number of ways in Washington and excellent warm climate bottlings can be found throughout the Columbia Valley and Red Mountain AVAs, while cooler climate expressions will prevail in Walla Walla and Natchez Heights. 
Now, I love Washington Syrahs, but if you ask me what I think the signature grape should be, I'd put all my chips on Sangiovese, that I think does something very special in Washington. I find Washington Sangios to be dense and powerful with notes of dried fruits, sweet tobacco, and earth, especially when grown in the Yakima Valley. Call me crazy, but I think Washington could be to Sangio what Argentina is to Malbec and New Zealand is to Soft Blanc. Okay, so maybe everyone won't agree with me about that, but almost everyone does agree that Cabernet Sauvignon in Washington is quite remarkable. The producers in the 70s and 80s, like Woodward Canyon, Quilcita Creek, and Leonetti Cellar, that put Washington on the wine map, did it by leaning heavily on Cab Sauv. And wines made from it here are renowned for the pure way in which they express the grape's fruit profile. Look for bottles from Red Mountain, the Horse Heaven Hills, the Waluke Slope, and Walla Walla Valley. In a region with this array of red grapes available to winemakers, it shouldn't be a surprise that there are some excellent red blends floating around out there. Apart from the Rhone styles we already mentioned, most of them are driven by Cab Sauv and other Bordeaux reds, but producers here can get creative at finding just the right grape to pair with the big dogs, and they've got lots of options at their disposal. You'll find grape blends from throughout the state, especially from AVAs that are red dominant. Riesling is a big deal in Washington, so try that too. The best bottles have a rich, warm climate, tropical character to them, with passion fruit being a signature descriptor. Most of Washington's Rieslings will carry some residual sugar, but there are lots of dry examples that are worth keeping an eye out for. Look for wines made from fruit grown in Yakima Valley, the Columbia Gorge, and the Ancient Lakes. Finally, there are some really remarkable and imaginatively named single vineyard sites in Washington that are renowned for the quality of their fruit and of the wines made from it. The owners of these vineyards are typically very careful about whom they sell fruit to, selecting only winemakers whom they trust to produce a quality wine that won't damage the reputation of their vineyard. So if you see a named vineyard on a Washington bottle, there's a good chance that you're in for a treat. Thanks again for joining me for another Winecast. I'm proud to have made it to 100, and I have no plans to stop anytime soon. As my Instagram followers know, though, I'm embarking on another certification, this time on Italian wine, so that may slow me up a little as I devote more time to study. But be on the lookout for a fair number of upcoming casts on Italy and its amazing wines. If this cast was helpful, enjoyable, and or interesting to you, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and always feel free to leave a question, comment, or request. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.